to the first item on the agenda. Please, before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they complete, complete their remarks, the chair will go down the line of members of the select board, inviting each by name to provide any further comment, questions, or motions. Please hold your, your comments until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until the chair yields the floor to you, if at all. And finally, in accordance with past practices, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by town council, attorney Heim by a roll call. So with that, we will go to agenda item two, which is discussion and approval. Um, I'll turn it over to our town manager, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this is an idea that has been brought before the board via correspondence received, and I believe board members have also received emails from residents about an idea of, given these times, given the, the desire of people to get outside and remain as healthy as possible in these times, the need for us to open up more public space for people to be able to get outside to avoid crowding on our existing recreational assets. So in a very short amount of time, Dan Amstutz from the planning department has done a great amount of work, uh, working with uh, a, a group called Neighborways who has been doing this in other jurisdictions across the country. Uh, who, and locally, actually, is an Arlington, uh, there's an Arlington resident working for them that has helped Dan do a great deal of this work. So I've asked, Dan, I've promoted Dan to panelist, um, and I'd like him to run through the concept that he would like for the board to discuss and approve tonight, uh, and then answer any questions that they might have. So, uh, Dan, do you want me to bring up the PowerPoint uh, that you provided to the board? Is that how you'd like to handle this? Um, yes, that would be fine. Okay, let me do that. And Dan, if you could just identify yourself by name and uh, sure. position with the town. I'm Daniel Amstutz, Senior Transportation Planner with the Department of Planning and Community Development. Thank you. And I do that because the way Attorney Heim laid out for the rules uh, when we first started that, uh, I have to bear in mind that people are not only um, coming in through Zoom, as we had last week, sometimes people do attend through their phone so they don't have the benefit of um, seen and with people's names under it. So it's just for an accurate record and to make sure we're affording everybody the same opportunity. Is that right, Attorney Heim? He's nodding and said yes. That's right. So okay. yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. So Dan, I, I have the presentation up on the screen, so I'll, I'll just uh, scroll right. as you advise me. Uh, all right. Um, so I guess uh, you have all the slides up then? Yeah, can uh, board members can okay. see the slides? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I'll try to run through this um, fairly quickly. I believe you've been sent a copy of the slides uh, in advance. So um, just a little overview, uh, just some brief background as to how we kind of ended up on this idea, um, why it's needed, the, the concept behind it, the goals of it, the pilot itself, and then the kind of support needs that um, we were uh, looking to have from the town, from the public works and public uh, police department in particular, um, when I gave this presentation a week ago. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so there was um, an internal meeting that we had um, with uh, myself and the town manager, uh, chief of police, public works director and uh, director of planning and community development. Um, we had talked about doing, there were sort of two different concepts that had been raised. One was expanding sidewalks along Mass Ave and another sort of wide streets to allow for people to um, to social distance while they were walking along those streets. And then another uh, idea was sort of the shared streets where we'd actually allow people to walk in the middle of the street um, or bike in the middle of the street and just generally have more space for them to socially distance on, on lower traffic streets. And, and also this has been uh, uh, the issues with the Minuteman bikeway being crowded uh, also feed into this discussion. So we've had a number of resident requests in order to do that. Um, as it happened, the week before we had this conversation, we had, I had spoken to Neighborways Design uh, and Jessica Mortel, who is a uh, resident as well, who works for Neighborways, 
um, they have some funding through the Lawrence and Lillian Solomon Foundation, which is a local nonprofit or local foundation. Um, and so it matched up very well that we were interested in this, or we pivoted to this shared streets idea instead of doing a expanded sidewalks on Mass Ave as uh, public works and police had some concerns about that. Um, onto the next slide, please. Um, and so why were we thinking of this and why did we, we receive some questions about it? Well, again, crowded trails uh, that we've seen, uh, you know, many of the sidewalks in our neighborhoods are five or six feet wide, generally speaking. So in order for somebody, if there are two people walking sort of against each other on the same side of the street, usually one will you know, either have to walk into the street or cross the street. Uh, I've done it myself a number of times. I, I also live in Arlington. Um, there's, we've seen an increase in people walking and biking and with more warmer weather, certainly uh, an increase in people wanting to get outside and out of their homes. Um, again, already see from pictures and just from uh, experience, people are walking in the street already. And then although there are fewer vehicles on the speed, there's actually been quite uh, reported in incidents of increased speeding. Um, this is an image from a, a news report from WBUR where the MassDOT has identified um, there were something like 30 traffic fatalities in April of last year. And there were 30 traffic fatalities in April last month, even though uh, statewide traffic volume has dipped more than 50%. So the traffic rate has effectively doubled. So the speeding issue is raising to uh, be very uh, critical here. Um, next slide, please. Um, and this is a very um, sort of well-known study or number of studies that have looked at the relationship between speed and, um, and pedestrian injury and fatality. Um, that if, so even if a car is traveling at 30 miles an hour and it hits a pedestrian, it's still a um, 50% chance that a pedestrian will be killed in that instance. And so the idea of having, if you do try something like shared streets, that it has to be a slow street and slowing traffic down is definitely um, a concern that many of our residents have when it comes to through traffic, of course, and cut through traffic, but now understanding that with fewer cars on the road, there's sort of less friction between different cars. Um, and so the need for slow speeds is really important here as this uh, slide identifies. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a basic concept that we started working with and uh, Neighborways Design created this, um, is that it focuses on these local quiet residential streets, prioritizing active transportation so people can walk and bike and again, socially distance, um, keep things low speeds in the 10 to 20 mile an hour range and really using uh, materials that are easily movable and changeable um, that you can sort of test and, and remove and replace as needed. <clears throat> um, sort of a, a tactical urbanism approach as we, we uh, in the tra transportation profession talk about. It would be closed to through vehicle traffic to reduce the amount of vehicles that are actually moving through there, but still allows local and emergency access as needed, maintains the existing parking, and again, is flexible and adaptable in case, you know, it doesn't work exactly the way uh, we think it does that it's easily, you can take things away. Um, it's not permanent. Um, next slide, please. So there's quite a, uh, a number of communities throughout the US that are doing this. Uh, I would say you could add in, you know, Europe and, and countries around the world are trying this. Um, Oakland, California, there's a couple of images there. Bellevue, Washington, Burlington, Vermont. Um, they're all doing some form of shared streets. Uh, Oakland gained notoriety for saying they were going to close off 70 miles of streets, um, which they had previously identified in a transportation plan. And so again, it's using fairly movable, um, you know, sort of easy to, as easy to attain materials in order to do that. And onto the next slide. And this is just a testament to the, um, the response from the local residents is uh, generally very, very positive. Um, I've also spoken with the transportation manager in Brookline about their, they did sort of an ex expanded sidewalk project um, that's ongoing. And they have also found, you know, in Brookline that, that they have received no complaints. So it's all very, very positive from the people that are, that are using those streets and have experienced it. Um, next slide. 
Um, the goals of the project, again, prioritize safety. We want people to go slow. There will be some um, elements that we want to put in the street that will sort of narrow the lanes a little bit and uh, make it um, appear uh, you know, to be a narrower street. Um, we do want to try to alleviate crowding in parks and trails um, and then sidewalks, um, repurse, repurposing these low volume streets because um, there's quite a lot of street space out there that, that people could be using and it's all public space. It's all public right of way. Uh, we certainly, um, it'll be a week long pilot idea. And then during that time, we want to evaluate it, uh, the impacts and the success of it and collect data through observations and traffic counts and speeds and uh, similar type of uh, data collection to uh, have a debrief to see how everything worked. Next slide, please. Um, and so this is um, uh, some work that we had done prior to last week, which was that we'd done outreach to residents and community leaders we had spoken with, network analysis. We looked at different pilot locations and looked at different materials that we would need. Um, and we've done quite a bit of uh, additional outreach. Um, I received about 40 or so comments on the project. Last week we had gone out, uh, we flyered, uh, put a 200 flyers on homes um, within the Brooks Ave, uh, there are Brooks Ave, Chandler Street. Uh, actually, there's a map well, later on, which I can show you where they, they were put. But um, we've done a lot of outreach in the last week to um, get the, the barometer of the, of the residents in the neighborhood as well to see uh, what their interest level is. Um, next slide, please. And so the idea is that it would be a demo, it would sort of demonstrate a proof of concept for this, for potentially uh, bringing or creating something larger out of it, put it in place for one week. Again, evaluate, collect uh, data, make sure people are physical distancing, hear feedback from residents and their perspectives, and then look at the next steps. And um, you know, if it's successful, how do we scale it up to be something larger? Because I, I think we, we acknowledge that this is a pretty small space we're looking at and we'd like to make it larger. Um, next slide, please. And so we, we looked at Brooks Ave, um, I think we, we were looking for some a location that we wanted to um, you know, have, have a reasonable amount of success. So it's a fairly small location. It includes Brooks Ave, Varnum between Brooks and Herbert, and then the other adjoining streets, which are Milton, Melrose, Egerton, and, and Chandler. And so these would be the streets that would be shared and you know, no cut through traffic, local traffic only, but with emergency and delivery access, uh, garbage truck access, that sort of thing. Um, we had considered Herbert Road as another alternate uh, or as an alternate to this, but I think we, we determined that it was a little bit too lengthy and uh, had would be more complicated. In this version, we're looking at basically four gateways so that if you were approaching um, from Egerton, for example, there would be a sign um, certainly an example that I showed earlier that's sort of a sign that says either road closed or road closed through traffic. And then with other custom signs that we've ordered that say shared streets, um, uh, you know, local traffic only or local access only. And then it has um, some other images on it. Um, next slide, please. So why Brooks Avenue? We have thought about it as being a way to relieve some of the congestion on the Minuteman as an alternate. Um, I don't want to say a diversion, but really it's, if people feel like it is too crowded, they could use Brooks, but we are very uh, cognizant that we don't want Brooks to get crowded either. Um, <clears throat> that was uh, one of the concerns that I heard from the residents. Um, you know, it is right next to the Hardy School, high density of young children that are in there. Again, we received interest from um, residents that live on those streets and also that live in the, in the greater neighborhood. Um, and really this is more of a recreation type of asset or recreation type of street. There are other ways of doing this where you can have routes that lead to grocery stores or pharmacies or other essential businesses. And so this is from May 2nd, but it was about 70 degrees, a really beautiful day. And you can see quite a lot of people. This is between Lake Street and Varnum Street. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, so, you know, looking for support from the select board for this. Um, we were looking for material support from public works and um, police. Police have helped with data collection. Public works is helping quite a bit with different materials. Uh, the Solomon Foundation 
um, has been helping a little bit with funding for different um, signs and things, but most of it has been uh, technical assistance through uh, network analysis and uh, sort of boots on the ground type of work. Um, and on to the next slide. And then, um, so here is the, the timeline that we were looking at a couple of weeks out. And the idea is that we would implement this. We're, we're probably looking at Wednesday. Um, and uh, to actually put the materials on the ground and sort of officially start the shared street, and it would be in place for a week. And we would do, uh, you know, outreach to community residents and see if they can you know, do some observations uh, on a volunteer basis, but we would also have staff, um, either myself or from Neighborways Design, who would also be doing observations and uh, collecting data, whether it's, uh, again, seeing if people are socially distancing or, or also uh, looking at traffic and potentially speeds as well, and then be able to evaluate that after the uh, week-long pilot. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, again, we, we've actually, we signed an agreement with Solomon Foundation for the, the technical assistance and funding that they've provided for us. Um, we've contacted community members, again, flyered, uh, you know, as quickly as we can in the past week when we first uh, were looking at this and trying to get it, you know, on the ground as quickly as possible, considering this is, uh, it's a very uh, timely thing that we're trying to do. And then um, Neighborways is helping draft design and determine what material, what materials that we need as well. Um, next slide. Okay. Um, there is some more slides at the end, but uh, that's more of a uh, phase two if, if we want to talk about that um, right now or later. But I'd, I'll stop right here for any feedback at this time. Thanks, Dan. Um, <clears throat> before I uh, turn for to my colleagues, um, Mr. Chapdelaine, anything um, you wanted to add or? No, just thank you to Dan and the team from Public Works and the APD that have worked with Dan on this. Um, and, and an acknowledgement that about six weeks ago, maybe give or take six weeks ago, I received an email from a few town residents saying, hey, we should do this. And I, at that point said, hey, I like the idea, but um, you know, we're, we're, we're really strapped for time and resources. Um, but you know, I have to admit six weeks ago, I didn't know where we'd be today. And I think given where we are, what the next couple of months look like, even though, even though we're starting a slow reopening, uh, I, I do think this is an appropriate, uh, an appropriate step. It's a one-week pilot. It might work. It might not work. But um, I think we do have to be smart about how we're starting to use outdoor public assets to start to find a, you know, a, a safe way for people to get outdoors over the next few months. Thank you. Um, first, I will take a motion uh, by Mr. Dunn for purposes of discussion. Uh, I move approval of the pilot uh, as, as described and I leave it to the town manager, the discretion of the execution. And I'll take a second by Mr. Kiro. Yeah, second. Okay, and then now for discussion, Mr. Dunn. I, I like the proposal. I think it's well thought out. I'm really uh, satisfied with the reach out. Um, and I think that the scale of the pilot is exactly appropriate and we should give it a ride. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carroll? Yeah, thank you very much for all of the work on, on this. Um, I think it is, um, you know, a creative approach to, to trying to create a safe environment there. I, I, uh, I also appreciate the outreach to uh, residents and I read through all of the responses, which were overwhelmingly positive. There were some folks who had some concerns. I mean, they're concern, concerned that this will attract more people onto their, their street and, uh, and impact their social distancing. But I, I just wanna emphasize, you know, as I look at this, this is, this is actually to address that situation by opening up the street so that, um, you know, people can walk in the middle in a, in a relatively safe, uh, safe manner rather than, uh, crowding on the sidewalk, because I've also seen this phenomenon that Mr. Amstutz, I think we all have, has talked about of people trying to avoid one another uh, passing on the, on the streets. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to uh, support the pilot. I presume that, that um, you know, after the pilot is run and the analysis is done, that then that um, you'll be coming back to the board um, for any next steps. Mr. Chapdelaine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, that, that is... Absolutely the plan. Yeah, well, I mean, so it, depending on how it goes, right, it could either be an extension of this, 
perhaps a termination or in the best news, I think we'd be asking for more neighborhoods to be tried out uh, and extending it beyond just East Arlington. So, but after this one week, no matter what, coming back to the board for further consideration. Great, thank you very much. Thank you to both of you. Thank you, Mr. Kiro. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I also am excited for this. I know we've all received a lot of uh, correspondence in support of this. Um, and the sheer amount of correspondence that we received is a testament to the outreach to the residents because I, I think a lot of the correspondence was for people that are in the area of Brooks Ave that will be affected by this. And I think there's definitely a need for it. You know, we're out as the weather turns our families out bicycling every day and it gets a little hairy on the streets with cars going by. So it's definitely will be beneficial for families, particularly with young children to have a place to shoot towards where they know that they can safely uh, walk and cycle with uh, the kids and just for all residents. Um, one question as to traffic patterns for, for pedestrians and cyclists, are we gonna recommend just like in a normal street that people walking in one direction will walk on the right side of the street, people walking the other direction will stay to the right side of that street just to prevent kind of, you know, even pedestrians from walking into one another as this gets crowded? Um, Mr. Amstutz? Um, I think that is something that we can try to communicate. Um, I think in practice, it's difficult to to have people uh, do that <laughs> um, without, I don't know, some level of enforcement or sort of oversight. But we can we can try to recommend that. But on the other on the other hand, if you're walking along a street, um, depending on where you're going, you know, you're you're either walking on the left because you want to go to that side, or you want to go to the right if you want to go to that side. So um, I'd say human behavior being what it is, it's it's a little difficult to uh, ensure that that people follow those types of rules. Well, I think the way you just pose it to them is just for safety reasons. We're trying to keep mm -hmm. people spread out. And so if you're walking in this direction, you walk on this side. So everyone's back to back as opposed mm -hmm. to coming into head on traffic. In the pilot, I assume a lot of people are going to gravitate towards Brooks Ave to try to, to participate in the pilot. So I just think that's something that would help alleviate sort of the social distancing concerns, particularly from residents on Brooks Ave that are concerned about more people coming on to the street during the pilot. So that's just a suggestion. Okay. Um, and then I just did want, want to mention that this came up at the Economic Recovery Task Force meeting today and the business owners in East Islington were, were excited about it and they were eager to help with the outreach to residents about the pilot. So, you know, you can get from Allie would have the names of the business owners that wanted to help with the outreach. So I think that's one resource to tap just to get the word out on the, on the pilot. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Um, and Mr. Chapterlane, anything further to add on that in terms of, I don't know, if, no? Okay, uh, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I also support the, the pilot program. One question and uh, concern a couple of people that I spoke to about the project raised, and, and that's the first block of Brooks between Lake and, and Chandler. And, and some people thought that the signage wasn't actually going up until the Chandler block. It wasn't gonna be at the corner of Lake. So I'm wondering if you could clarify that, um, how that would work, because that is a concern for people coming up Lake Street towards Mass Ave who, who might take that right onto Chandler, just in terms of knowing what they're, what they're coming into. Mr. Amstutz. Thank you. Um, the idea is that it would go, um, or the actual sort of shared street area would start at the intersection of Lake and Brooks. Um, there is some, there's some design considerations that um, my colleague at Neighborways is looking into in terms of how that looks, but we thought that that intersection was particularly important. We've um, planning to put a pretty large uh, road closed to through traffic sign at that particular intersection. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, because well, we, we were planning to have the, the Chandler be part of that. If we were to let people in off of Lake, then I understand people probably uh, or use that right onto Brooks and then left onto Chandler to get into the neighborhood. Um, 
if if it is local traffic, if it is somebody trying to get to their house, it's certainly not a problem. Um, but you know, we're we're also not trying to uh, you know overly police this. Uh, we're looking for voluntary compliance for people to um, to seek out a different route to where they're going if they're sort of trying to cut through the Mass Ave. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think as you go forward in the week, you may you may see that maybe that has to be pushed back and. Um, you know, the numbers and, and the activity will dictate that. Another question in terms of what you are looking at in terms of shared streets and across other parts of town. And is there any, was there any discussion about perhaps not doing streets seven days a week, but maybe on weekends um, for, for future phases where it'd be a, a Saturday or Sunday type situation. I'm not talking about Brooks, but elsewhere in town. Okay, thank you, Mr. A question from Mr. DeCourcy, Mr. Amstutz, how, tell me how you say your last name correctly. Um, Amstutz is fine. Okay, Mr. Amstutz. Um, we, we've been looking at it, I think, as a sort of all day, 24 hours type of situation. Um, I think that was a concern that came up from Public Works in terms of the uh, things being left out sort of all night long and potentially blowing over or, or um, I don't know, walking away. Um, I think the the issue with the sort of Saturday Sunday is that it it we're we're trying to balance between what you might call an open streets where you do you close off the streets for several hours or for a day and have a sort of block party type deal. Um, we are trying to uh, discourage we want to discourage people from really congregating but actually using it for movement and travel but making it safer and more comfortable for, for people to walk and bike along those streets so that there's less traffic and the traffic is moving slower. So uh, I don't know if, uh, I suppose, you know, we could, we could have those um, materials put out like at the beginning of the weekend and then at the end of the weekend, that's something we could, we could look into. Mr. DeCourcy? Great, great, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this is a fantastic idea from the word go. Um, and I started to think of all the different residents that have contacted the board. And when I got to about the sixth name, I decided I'm not going to name them all because I'm going to leave somebody out. But that's evident in terms of um, how much support that there is out there. And uh, from uh, the comments we received, all but three were, please do this. This is great. This is fantastic. And the other three were more, more of a concern. And, you know, if, if it could work the way you say it was, but I don't think it's going to. Um, I think this is exactly what we need to do um, to adapt, or as the governor likes to say, pivot um, in terms of Arlington and um, how we move forward uh, in the next year or two. Um, we need to really look at keeping people safe, but also um, getting um, some changes uh, in terms of routine, uh, whether it be uh, pedestrian, bicycle, uh, other foot mode traffic. Um, I do have a question and I think it might be, I don't want to put Dan, Mr. Amstutz on the spot, but, um, and, and this is coming from someone who thought the bike path should have been closed long, long ago. And I'm glad you don't listen to me, but um, it, I would just ask Mr. our town manager in terms of the two areas um, that we talk about ad infinitum, um, I sort of see a similar process, but I don't know if it would be through Mr. Amstutz and others around if this is successful and it works, I anticipate that perhaps the same think tank would look around the bike path. And then my second question would be, um, as we've had discussions before, my colleagues have, uh, moving forward with uh, the small business economy here in Arlington, um, I know, especially with the warm weather coming up, Mr. Chapdelaine had spoken about that. If we were exploring the possibilities of um, retooling um, our streets in the uh, business area, would that be a different think tank or would it be the same process? So first question on Minuteman bike path, second on small business along the corridor. Mr. Chapterling? Yeah, thank you very much. So for the Minuteman, uh, we do still continue to talk about it. Uh, now as the weather is starting to get warmer, we're gonna continue to watch. We did hear reports that though it was busy this weekend that it was near you know, not hard to actually quantify it, but 90 plus percent compliance with face coverings, uh, which was, uh, we were all pleased to hear that. 
So I, I think that the hope is that if this pilot is successful and we expand it, it can take the pressure off the bike, the bike path. And instead of closing anything, have more openness for people to, to get outside. In terms of the second question about businesses, I definitely see this as the, the seed for how we start to think about using our outdoor space over these next few months. Um, I do think it's gonna be very challenging for restaurants to safely open, especially smaller restaurants to safely open um, with limited capacity. So I think though, though this is a different model, I do think that this can start to see the idea in all of our heads that utilizing outdoor space, potentially parking spaces, maybe even road lane space for restaurants to be able to do outdoor dining so that we can get them back open sometime in the near future, something we absolutely have to look at. And it will be the same or similar team of people that are looking at this. And then since I raised two questions that were a little off, I just want to check with Mr. Dunn. Um, Mr. Kiro. Mr. Hurd and Mr. DeCourcy. Okay, so here, uh, thank you to Dan, Mr. Amstutz for um, this great presentation. You can tell we're all excited and behind it. On a motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Any further questions and comments? If not, a roll call vote. Attorney Heim? Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kiro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's a unanimous vote, 5-0. Agenda item two is closed. We will now, um, with my colleagues' uh, approval for the consent agenda, we will take agenda items three, four, and five as a group. Uh, first, is there a motion to approve, Mr. DeCourcy? Move approval. Is there a second by second. Mr. Hurd? Um, on, on the consent Agenda three, four, and five. Um, Mr. DeCourcy, I know there was one here. Yes. Um, well, th 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 thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just in terms of comments on one of them that I had received was the uh, the banners at the at the, at the uh, Arlington High School. And um, did we want to talk about each one of those now, or did you want to? Oh, did, oh no, did, I just didn't know if you wanted to. Um, the rest are self-explanatory, but if yes. this is something you want to talk about a little so people are aware if that, you know. Oh, sure. Okay. No, thank you. Um, yeah. So it, it, as you know, unfortunately, with, with the pandemic, the, the high school graduation is not going to take place as, as it traditionally does. And there is a graduation committee at the high school, and they've been working very hard on honoring the seniors and doing a number of different things. And, and you've seen signs across town. And one of the, the things that they would like to do is, is honor the seniors by hanging banners that will have pictures of, I believe it's between five and seven seniors um, that they would like to hang along Mass Tab. I think it's a great idea and, and uh, really a nice way to recognize the, the achievements of, of the high school students and, and recognize the unique times that we're in. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Mr. Hurd, any co further comment or? No, I'm happy to support it. I'm glad to see that we're able to do this for the seniors since it's a tough situation to miss your high school graduation. So this is this is awesome. Mr. Kiro? Oh, I'm fine. That's Ms. Great. Sorry, Mr. Dunn. No comment. No comment. And uh, uh, kudos to uh, the school parents and school administration and staff that I'm just amazed. I'm, I'm just dizzy with all the things um, that they're working on and I'll leave it for them to um, let that play out when it's going to, but I do appreciate people, you know, adapting to the current times that we're in. So without any further question or comments on consent agenda three, four, and five, a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Hurd. Uh, roll call, please, Attorney Heim. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Kuro? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's 5-0, approval of agenda items three, four, and five. We now go to agenda item six. Mr. Kuro? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I will be recusing myself from discussion and uh, vote on this matter uh, due to a conflict of interest. Okay. And accordingly, I'll be muting and, and uh, stopping my video. Attorney Heim, just uh, Mr. Carroll stating that, is that enough for the record? Yeah, we just want to confirm that uh, his mic is turned off and his uh, screen is turned off. Thank you. Then that yep. it is. We look good to go. 
Okay, and uh, the, the uh, minutes sh shall so, so reflect. Um, so with that, with my remaining three colleagues on consent agenda item number six, appointment of a new election worker, worker Savannah Kiro, Millet Street, unenrolled precinct 15. Um, is there a motion to approve Mr. DeCourcy? Yep, so move approval. Is there a second by Mr. Dunn? Second. And done. Um, any questions or comments, Mr. DeCourcy? No comments. Mr. Dunn? He's saying no. Mr. Hurd? No. No, Mr. Kiro has recused himself and I have no further comments. So no, any further questions, but if not on a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. And that record will reflect it. agenda item six is a four zero vote. And Mr. Kiro had recused himself and had virtually Zoom left the meeting. We'll now continue on with the agenda to public hearings, agenda item seven. Um, and Mr. Kiro has just returned at the beginning of agenda item seven. So if the minutes could reflect that proposed tree removal for the Mass Ave sidewalk project. I'd like to start off with our town manager, Mr. Chapterlain. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so before the board tonight um, are two requests related to two projects, one being the Mass Ave sidewalk project that we hoped is soon to commence. Uh, the second being related to the Lake Street bikeway intersection project, which has actually already started uh, somewhat uh, and is looking forward to progressing. So I'm gonna ask uh, if the, the chair so allows uh, Director of Public Works, Mike Rademacher, to describe each to the board and answer any questions they might have. Thank you, Mr. Chaplain. Mr. Rademacher, if you could just state your full name and job title for the record. Sure, Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and the members of the select board. Uh, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, so we, we have two projects uh, that um, Mr. Chaplain uh, mentioned, the, sidewalk replacement on Mass Ave, which is from Pleasant Street to Franklin, uh, Franklin and uh, as well as sidewalk replacement on Broadway through that same stretch. Uh, and in addition, we have the bike path project at Lake Street. The, math, the Mass Ave project as designed will replace all the sidewalks uh, through those sections and provide uh, better tree wells and other amenities through that stretch. Unfortunately, there's one tree at approximately 420 Mass Ave that the construction of a proper driveway apron will have a significant impact to. It's a 14 inch um, honey locust and it was determined that we, it was, it's believed that it would not survive construction. So we felt it better to plan for its replacement rather than try to keep it um, uh, in place. Uh, that Mass Ave project, in addition to replacing a tree in the vicinity of that one tree, will plant nine other trees throughout the limits of the project. Uh, as outlined in the memo, briefly, I can say that there are a few in front of uh, Whittemore Park, a few um, in Broadway Plaza, three or four along the uh, American Alarm Building, and um, a few on uh, Franklin Street. Uh, so. There, there's that one project, as I mentioned, that we're taking one down, but planting 10 in total. And the bike path project, which its sole purpose is to create better visibility and usability for the bike path crossing for both users of the path and Lake Street. And one aspect of doing that was to widen the bike path at that location to create a, a more uh, visible location for folks to wait and cross Lake Street. The unfortunate consequence of widening the bike path is the, uh, the impact to several trees uh, along either, either side of the current bike path. So that project proposes to remove six trees, but also proposes to plant back eight in the immediate vicinity of that project with the commitment that we would look for other locations in nearby neighborhoods to increase street tree plantings uh, in, the, in the near future. Uh, while both of these projects, we would typically have a separate tree hearing, um, they, they're not necessarily required by Massachusetts general law. The town has taken a, a more transparent approach in recent years to tree removals, where we have had tree hearings for projects 
uh, other than those that require them specifically by law. Uh, given the situation we're in now, uh, it's a, more, a little more difficult to have these hearings. And given that these two projects, because they, uh, one, the bike path is not, um, they are not street trees, and two, Mass Ave is a, a state route. And because it's a town project on a state numbered route uh, by law, it does not um, require a tree hearing by state law. So that is why I'm asking the board to consider these uh, without a separate tree hearing. I brought this, these both these projects up to the tree committee recently, last week. We talked about the trees to come down and the proposed species to be replaced, to replace them. And I uh, received um, uh, overwhelming support from the, the uh, members, both in the trees that we plan to replace and the process by which I'm asking the board to consider this. Thank you, Mr. Rademacher. <clears throat> um, and since in, um, in that vein, um, this is a public hearing. Uh, we're taking them separately because there, there'll be two separate votes. Um, so if uh, on the proposed tree removal on the Mass Ave sidewalk project, um, I'll give it a little bit of time if anybody waves through Zoom or through, I believe it's star nine on your telephone. Is that correct, Mr. Chapdelaine? Correct. And I, so I see the, um, Maura Albert, who is one of our appointees under the next agenda item has her hand raised. So I we can ask her if she would like to comment on this. And also Susan Stamps has her hand and raised. Susan Stamps. Okay. Um, first I'd like to uh, call on Ms. Albert, if you could say your full name and either uh, Arlington address or other Arlington affiliation. She's, she's, we can see your name, but oh, thank you there. Here I am. No, I did not have a question about that. I was just um, experimenting. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll move Miss Albert back over and then we'll bring her back for the uh, appointment. Okay, um, next I'd like to call on Ms. Stamps, if you could just identify yourself for the record. We see you, but we don't hear you. You're still muted. Let's see. There, there you, you are. Oh, okay. Um, I'm Susan Stamps, uh, member of the tree committee and just wanted to support uh, the pro both of the projects and what Mike said about how actually he doesn't need permission from the tree committee or from the town particularly to take down these trees because Mass Ave is a state highway. So there's an exemption for the DPW superintendent is in charge for Mass Ave, which is a state numbered highway and also the bike path project where the um, trees are on the bike path, which I guess isn't a public way. So uh, we think they both look like good pro projects and um, wish to thank him for his work. Thank you. Great picture, Ms. Stamps. <laughs> uh, it really is, sorry, I couldn't help it. It's a girl thing, it's a she thing, sorry. Um, so uh, with that, I will um, look to my colleagues on agenda item seven for a motion by- Move approval. Mr. Curo, right. seconded by Mr. Dunn, Second. JC and Mr. Dunn, uh, Mr. Curo, any further comments? No, I'm, I'm satisfied with the presentation. I, I, I greatly appreciate the fact that, that the, um, uh, Mr. Rademacher did, um, consult with the tree committee and, and um, that the warden was, um, um, involved in this and, and uh, um, mapping out a way to, to uh, pursue the projects with uh, minimal, um, uh, well, actually not just minimal tree loss with uh, a, a great replacement program. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Oh, I'm excited for both projects, particularly the sidewalk project, which has been a long time coming. And thank you to Mike Rodemacher for reaching out to us and having this hearing, even though it wasn't required to. And I think the plan, you know, we've heard from our residents as to how they feel about the trees and the tree canopy. And I think the plan addresses that in a, in a practical and meaningful way. 
Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also want to thank Mr. Rademacher for his efforts in, in reaching out to the tree committee, actually posting the notice. I saw the notice actually on the tree on Mass Ave. So, so going through with, with that process and they're, they're two great projects and uh, looking forward to their implementation. Thank you. And Mr. Dunn? It's a sound process and a good conclusion. I'm happy to support. Thank you. And my lengthy remarks would be ditto to what my colleagues all said. So any further questions or comments, if not on agenda item seven, a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. That's five zero vote. Agenda item seven is closed. We now go to. Thank you. Uh, uh, you're welcome. Agenda item eight. I know uh, our DPW director, Mr. Rademacher, already outlined um, the parameters of that. Um, I don't know if Mr. Chaplin or if we want to see if um, Ms. Albert or anyone else wants to speak. There are no additional hands raised right now. Okay, so first um, I will take a motion to approve by approval. Mr. Hurd seconded by Mr. Dunn. Um, Mr. Mr. Hurd? No any further comments? comments. Um, Mr. DeCourcy? No further comments. Mr. Dunn? No comments. And Mr. Carroll? No further comments, thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that on agenda item eight, a motion by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Uh, Attorney Heim, roll call please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. That's 5-0. Unanimous vote. Agenda item eight is closed. We now move to appointments. Um, agenda item number nine, Disability Commission, term to expire 1-31-2023. Paul Paravano. Um, first, I... Do we have Mr. Paravano here? If I, we do, if I could ask uh, through the, if, with the town manager's permission to ask Mr. Paravano to state his name and address and give us um, whatever information to let everyone know why we're lucky enough to have found you, especially in these times, <laughs> to agree to uh, volunteer uh, here on, on the town. Uh, Madam Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm so delighted to join with you and the board this evening and uh, manager Chap Delane. Um, I've been a resident of Arlington for uh, 26 years. I guess I'm supposed to state my name at the beginning here. I am Paul Paravano. Yes. I live on uh, 70 Bellington Street in Arlington. And I think I've had the pleasure of meeting uh, each member of the board. I formerly was chair of the Housing Corporation uh, of Arlington's board of directors. Um, I work at MIT and I've been uh, blind all my life pretty much since I was an infant and have benefited greatly from a lot of technology. And I feel strongly that the Disability Commission gives uh, Arlington a, a, very, <clears throat> a very special opportunity to take good care of citizens who uh, have disabilities of various types. Um, I was uh, just so elated a number of years ago when I approached my precinct to vote uh, at the Brackett School and found that Arl the people of Arlington had purchased a uh, uh, voice uh, output voting machine, which I was delighted to use after many years of having to rely on someone else to uh, mark the ballot for me. So I think that Arlington does a number of things already for people with disabilities. I'm anxious to talk about voting technology, about pedestrian um, safety and use of sidewalks and streets, and also transportation. I think those are major issues. I see that the Disability Commission already is working with high school students um, because it's important to talk to young people about uh, inclusion of people with disabilities. I'm very excited about this opportunity and grateful for the recommendation of the town manager. Thank you. Um, first, I will take a motion to approve by Mr. Dunn and a second, uh, a second by second. Mr. Kiro, Mr. Dunn. 
Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Paul when I was an undergraduate. I was working in what we called the Undergraduate Association. I was a, an, a, both an appointed and elected official there at various points in time. And uh, he was excellent. And, uh, you know, it's one of those wonderful coincidences that, you know, 30 years later, you, you get to run, you get to work with him again. And I'm so glad that uh, he's volunteering. We are lucky to have him. Thank you, Mr. Don. Mr. Paravano, any uh, insider information you can give us on our colleague? Um, I think we'll I think we'll have to wait for the end of the meeting to do that, Madam Chair. <laughs> <laughs> the secret is I had more hair on my head then. <laughs> I see. Well, th that's that's not something I would have noticed, but I'm delighted that we shared the infinite corridor together. Thank you. He got you there, Dan. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kiro. Yeah. Hi, Paul. Uh, it's, I was thrilled to see your um, your name come through for for this. Um, I, I know we I uh, first met uh, Paul on some educational matters locally, and then uh, through the uh, HCA. And so I'm I'm just thrilled and and very grateful that you're uh, offering your talents in, in this um, this regard. And uh, I love the um, the the three priorities that you checked off as well. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hurd. Thank you for serving. This is such an important board in the of all the boards that we have in town, and uh, I think your experience will will mean a lot to the board in helping it move forward as we in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. DeCorsi. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Paravano, for for stepping up to uh, serve on the Disability Commission. I like the other members of the board. I met Paul. Uh, years ago, our, our daughters actually played youth soccer and, and uh, basketball together in high school, and we would see each other often. So thank you so much for, for your service. Thank you very much. And uh, my, I share my colleagues' sentiments, and um, I really appreciate uh, the way you're continuing to contribute to the town of Arlington, um, as well as really bringing a good voice in terms of um, people who have uh, problems with their vision are partially or totally blind or legally blind. There's all kinds of facets of that. And you certainly um, have been there and can um, help spread the word and advocacy about that. And I hope it stands as encouragement. You don't have to be an MIT professor, but um, if, if you are someone out there and you think, gee, maybe my disability isn't something that, you know, rises to the occasion that this is something I can do. Um, you and other members of the commission are certainly um, uh, fine examples that uh, in the best people we need to have on that commission. Any closing remarks? I, I always say Mr. Paravano. I want to say Paul. I'm just trying to make a clean record. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I should just clarify. I'm not a professor. I do uh, gov government relations for MIT. My main job is to keep a smile on the face of town officials around MIT. Okay, job well done. Um, if there's any uh, further questions or comments, if not on motion by Mr. Dunn, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Uh, Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Uh, yes, and that, no matter what, I will now refer to Paul as Prof Professor Paravano. <laughs> given you, I bestowed that title upon you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <laughs> uh, uh, so agenda nine is closed. We go to agenda item 10 uh, under appointments, LGBTQIA Rainbow Plus. I, for some reason it's not written down, but I think it's uh, Rainbow Plus Commission terms to expire 131, 2023. We have Mara Albert, Leonard Goldstein, Susan Ryan, Ryan Vollmer. Um, I'll just wait until um, the town manager says we have our three Prospective yeah, appointees. I just invited all three to be able to speak and be seen if they so choose. Okay, and I'll go alphabetically as it appears in our agenda. Um, Miss Albert, if you could just say your name and address for the record, please. Oh, let me. Uh... Oh, one second. You didn't get unmuted yet. Sorry. Hey, now we hear me now? Here. Yes, thank you. Okay. My name is Mara Albert. I live at 19 Wyman Terrace here in Arlington. I've lived here for about 20 years. Thank you. And if uh, you want to just uh, a little um, background um, in terms of your experience your, or your interest in um, the commission or anything else you'd like to highlight uh, for who's viewing this meeting. Okay. Um, 
I'm a former teacher from Winchester Elementary School, 37 years. So most of my connections have been in Winchester. Uh, now that I'm retired, um, I want to get to know my Arlington community more and especially want to help with the LGBTQIA plus folks that live in town. Um, I'm a big proponent of um, intergenerational connections and just connections in general. Um, I know there are many different uh, groups in the town that serve LGBTQIA plus folks, um, but I like to see them connecting more with each other than they already do. So that would be a goal of mine. Um, I'm really excited to participate and uh, just to get to know all of you. Thank you, I'm excited. Uh, next, uh, Leonard Goldstein, please correct me if I pronounced your last name incorrectly. You have it right, Leonard Goldstein. I live at 23 Newman Way in Arlington. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be joining this commission um, and honored to, um, uh, to be recommended for this. Um, I have lived here for about 16 years uh, with my husband, and I thought it was about time that I give back to the community that has given so much to me. Uh, in my professional life, I'm the chief financial officer for a nonprofit called Keshet that works for LGBTQ inclusion in Jewish life nationally. And uh, so I've been in this world for, for quite a while on the professional side, uh, and I thought that um, I could use that experience, um, both my, uh, my, my professional work um, as a CFO and my, uh, the work that I've, I've learned about in terms of building networks and connections and allyship and working with other our marginalized uh, groups, uh, particularly something that interests me. So I am, I'm really thrilled to be, to be joining the commission at this time. Thank you. Thank you. So am I. And uh, Susan Ryan Volmar, if you could just say your name and address for the record. Uh, my name is Susan Ryan Volmar, and I live at 67 Overlook Road. Um, and is there anything you'd like to highlight, um, any interest, anything you'd like to bring um, with you as you start work on the commission, or it's totally voluntary? Sure. I, uh, my wife and I have lived in Arlington with our two daughters for about 14 years. Um, they're both at uh, Arlington High School. I have a senior. It's been very sad. Oh, sorry. Last two months. I'm sorry. Oh, it's brutal. It's brutal. But um, I'm thrilled uh, to be joining the commission. Just very excited. Um, I think Arlington has been a, a wonderfully welcoming place, but you know, there's always room for improvement and there's always room for collaboration among groups. So I'm just thrilled to be doing something. Yes, and um, before I turn to my colleagues, I want to thank you all for coming on, especially during these times. We had Mel Golsipe, um, the previous chair, who really took this committee and expanded it. It blossomed um, and br brought a lot of uh, invigoration to it, along with commission members. And I had occasion to meet the two um, recently uh, appointed uh, commission mem member uh, presidents or chairs of the LGBTQ. TQIA Rainbow Plus Commission. Um, so um, I'm looking to uh, how you adapt uh, in terms of continuing the mission of this committee, especially around um, all facets of um, what the commission can do and the committee can do, especially with our younger people, which is just about anyone other than me, is our younger people. <laughs> um, first, I will take a motion by. So moved. Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Any uh, uh, first, uh, Mr. Carroll? I just want to thank you very much for offering your time um, uh, to the town on, on this uh, commission. Um, the commission's been really vital um, to the work that we've done in, in uh, pushing up our uh, municipal equality index um, and it really helping us to to uh, brainstorm around those ideas and the mix of skills that you bring with teaching and media and communications and nonprofit leadership I think will ju just help to make it a much stronger uh, organization um, and uh, Ms. Brian Fulmer it's great to see you again so <laughs> um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Carroll. Mr. Hurd? So just thanks to everyone for volunteering your time to serve. This is really such an important commission, um, just like the last one. And you know, there's a lot of work that is done and there's a lot of work to be done. 
So I look forward to working with you all. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you each for your willingness to serve on the commission. And thank you, uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, volunteers, volunteers are what make the town work. So we really appreciate it. And I, I loved reading your resumes and you're all really very, very well qualified and you're gonna bring uh, great things to this group. So I, I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so uh, without any further question or comment on a motion by Mr. Carroll, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curie. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahan. Yes. That's a unanimous vote. Agenda item 10 is now closed. My pen, it is 10, okay. <laughs> We now turn to citizens open forum. It's sort of a little out of line with our policy where I felt we were having a public hearing, which we didn't have to have and we chose to have it. And since there are no other Warren article hearings, um, I chose to put citizens open forum on. So with that, and except, except an unusual, and if anyone is interested in speaking under citizens open forum, if you could do your wave feature on Zoom, Zoom or your star nine on your telephone or cell phone and Except on, in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor a decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. Um, do we have anyone for citizens open forum? Uh, yes, someone identifying themselves as Kim. Kim, and I'm just gonna give it a little bit longer in case anybody else is um, considering. Uh, no one else right now. Okay, well, okay. So uh, I'll turn it to um, Kim, name and address our Arlington affiliation for the record, please. And Kim has to unmute. Oh, we have to unmute Kim, I, I'm not in control <laughs> and I should be. Okay, sorry, you're on, thank you. Am I on? Yes. Okay, hi, this is Kim Holt, sorry about that. I didn't realize I was on this Zoom, I have two and the other one says Kim Holt. <laughs> okay. This is Kim Holt, um, thank you for hearing from me tonight. I actually am in between addresses in Arlington but I've been an Arlington resident for almost exactly 20 years now and I think everybody on the board and um, Mr. Tappeldine and Mr. Heim know who I am, but for anybody else, that's I've been working with youth and other people in Arlington for almost a full 20 years now. Um, thank you for hearing from me tonight. It's become very apparent to me in the last several months for, and especially the last weeks and days, just how important my connection to Arlington is. And I'm not gonna go into that right now. Most of you at the front of the room know why that is. I had to leave Arlington briefly because of the injuries from an accident in an MBTA ride ban. And I've kept my permanent location and all my connections here, but it's been very hard. And the love and care and concern of everybody in Arlington, as I've had to struggle with that and I'm on my way into another Arlington address has been amazing. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And, and, you still have time. You should, I just want to say you're welcome. But yeah, thank you. The, you still have time. Don't worry about I'm that. Before the board tonight, because last time I was before the board was early October. It was actually when I was still having trouble making words fill into sentences and stuff. And it was a contentious meeting, and I was the second speaker in open forum. And Chair Mahone actually made me very angry. And I think very appropriately, but very vehemently, and then in a letter to the editor afterwards, I made very clear she made me very angry. Well, I want people to know that this may be her last meeting as chair, and this is Dan Dunn's last meeting on the board, and I want to thank them both very much for their service. I want people to know that Chair Mahone and I are friends. <laughs> and it, you know, you can disagree with people and even vehemently and angrily disagree as long as you're appropriate and do things in the right way and get past disagreements. And even we still don't agree on all those issues, but we've been talking more friends. She's actually been helping me, we're supporting each other. I understand what happened that night. You know, things happen, things disagree, you get past them. You work together in a town and in a community. And I want to thank her so much for her service and her for support of this town and this community. It's been wonderful. Dan Dunn, thank you so much for your service. 
I'm sad to see you go. Thank you, everybody on the board. And Mr. Tappeldine, I know it's been a very tough year or two. And I've tried to be very appropriate when I've had criticism and private in the most part and talk to you individually about things. And I'm really sad to see the state things have come in. And I really don't like the attacks that are happening. And I really appreciate the code of conduct for meetings that's being discussed. And I just want to model that the last time I was here, I was angry and I was vocal, but I've tried to be appropriate. And I'm back to say thank you. Yeah, and life goes on after anger and disagreements. We're a community. It's yes, it certainly does. And uh, uh, all of us know of Kim K. Holt's uh, many, many, many contributions um, to uh, the town, even in spite of everything that we're all dealing with in uh, the COVID-19 world. Um, as and actually, kid. I'm in a COVID-19 isolation place right now. I've had COVID-19 and they're wanting me. So I may have to go any second. So I oh, did want to let you know that. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. And, and um, as always, every member of this board, along with the town manager, and, and um, I want to thank Chief uh, Flaherty um, at, uh, over the weekend, as well as uh, the town manager in our affiliation with the uh, coalition out of Somerville that we have. And I'm happy that um, we're doing everything we can. And, and Kim is being taken care of and she feels she is safe. And um, that I'm very proud of it us. It was amazing all. help that I've gotten this weekend and, and, and healed all the damage that was done over the last couple of weeks. Thank you so much, guys. You're welcome. All right, you thank get you. rested and get better. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you. And so with that, that's all I had on for Citizens Open Forum. Maura Albert has raised her hand again. I'm not, I'm not sure if she intended to or not. Uh, well, let's, well, let's find out. Um, just uh, name and address for the record, please. As soon as you're on. Don't worry. I, I, the reason I am not the moderator and in control of this meeting is because you would be amazed at what I could and could not do. I can see um, Ms. Albert. And I think can you hear I, me? Now I can hear you. Name and address okay. for the record, please. Mara Albert and 19 Wyman Terrace. And this time I meant to raise my hand because <laughs> my wife, Linda, who I didn't mention in my introduction, has a question. Well, Sorry. not really a question, but a comment. I think this is the public comment part. Yes. Um, and um, really it was a, just started out as a suggestion about the Brooks app. Um, I guess experiment or or whatever you're doing. Um, I was thinking about how um, I've been getting the groceries delivered primarily, and I was wondering how it would work if, like, my street was kind of a public, you know, whatever you want to call it, like the kind of the uh, extension of the bike path type. So I was thinking that if you do this in different places, you could designate like one day a week where you could advise the people who live there that that would be a good day to get deliveries because you're not doing it that day or maybe even just certain time during the day, um, especially if it's gonna be ramped up and done on other streets. I just know that's something that would be comforting to me as a resident. Mm -hmm. I live there, but if I did, um, that would be a good idea consider. Thank you. And um, I think Mr. Chapterline, there was, as we take this by case by case basis in terms of the street being 100% closed, there would be exceptions, I think all seven days. Is that correct? For Yeah. So the, the way um, it was approved tonight, local traffic, emergency responders, and deliveries could still access the road at safe or slow speeds. But I think, I think what was just described is one of the things we'll be watching. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how disruptive are delivery vehicles um, coming and going through the neighborhood, whether it be grocery delivery or Amazon or whatever it might be, UPS, FedEx, and whether or not a designated day is appropriate or if the volume is low enough that it doesn't cause a problem will be something we'll look at during the pilot. But I, I think it raises an important point for us to pay attention to. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thanks. And I also just wanted to say how incredibly refreshing it is to hear uh, people talking, going through the law and the rules, and it's just, uh, given all that we've been living through, it's, uh, it's really nice to see the whole government working well. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about it, and thank you for so She's going to be fantastic, along with everybody else. Um, so.
Sorry, I'm all I'm really cooped up. You're the only new people I get to talk to. So sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that, Citizens Open Forum. There's an, there is an, an additional hand raised. Okay, this will be the last. We will move on because we do have um, other things. But I do want to hear someone who um, uh, the name, Mr. Chapterline. Yeah, uh, I think I, I might be mispronouncing the last name. Janet Zipes. Janet Zipes. Okay, um, Ms. Zipes, if you could correctly say your name and address up. Oh, I'm sorry for the record. When you when we can hear you, we can see your name, but we'll wait until we get audio. Okay, can you hear and, me now? Yes, we can. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Janet Zipes. Address is ninety six Spy Pond Parkway. Thank you so much. So I'm not sure if this is uh, related to the shared streets initiative, which I, I think is great. Um, but I've noticed in the past few weeks that um, the traffic lights in East Arlington and maybe in the rest of the town are staggered, seem to be staggered in a way that it's um, taking longer to get around by car. Um, and I've even experienced some significant wait times on Lake Street waiting to turn to Mass Ave despite very little car traffic. So I'm wondering if this is related to the shared streets initiative or part of a traffic calming program, or maybe it's the contactless street, um, the contactless um, uh, crossing signs, the change that's made there. I don't know if any of you have insight into that. Certainly, For first I will tell you, not imagining it, that that is the case. Um, I Every day um, the town manager, Mr. Chapterlane and, uh, Health and Human Services Director uh, Christine Bongiorno and uh, other members of uh, the town uh, hall, whether physically there or the police station, they meet every day uh, since March 12th when Arlington took really uh, decisive steps of um, taking this extremely seriously and basically discuss discussing every single thing every single day. So I think it's not so much as uh, traffic calming, but I, if I could, I, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I know Mr. Chapterlane would articulate it better than I, um, Mr. Chapterlane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so yeah, yeah, as you said, she's, she's not imagining it, Janet, you're not, you're not imagining it. Uh, uh, probably six weeks ago now, uh, we decided to turn off the need to push the pedestrian button and along Mass Ave and Broadway, have the pedestrian signals come on automatically to reduce the need for people to touch the button and reduce um, the contact surfaces people will touch. So we will be, as things start to ramp back up, we'll be taking a look at whether or not it's appropriate to keep that in place. Um, so since I say sometime in the next two weeks or so, we'll, we'll decide whether or not we wanna continue that. But um, that, that's what you're experiencing is uh, along Mass Ave and Broadway, us turning, uh, making the pedestrian signals automatic rather than push button activated. Okay, which I think is a great idea. I was just, I'm glad to hear I'm not imagining things. So thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. I have those moments too. And <laughs> sometimes I, I am imagining them, I may be. But anyways, with that, we will go to agenda, agenda item 11, uh, vote of adoption on Arlington's hazard mitigation plan. Our town manager, Mr. Chapterlane. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I know the agenda identifies Ms. Rate. Uh, however, she's at the ARB meeting tonight. Uh, tonight, what we're looking for is the board to formally adopt this updated or new hazard mitigation plan. As the board may recall, it received a pretty thorough in-depth presentation uh, several months ago now uh, during this planning process. This is the, rather than repeating that presentation, this is the final plan after hearing feedback from the board, after going through the public process, working with internal and external stakeholders, uh, and putting this plan in place uh, meets uh, several regulatory guidelines, as well as putting us in a position to be able to continue to access grant funds uh, to better protect ourselves against future hazards. So I'll do my best to try to answer any questions the board may have, but what we're looking for tonight is a vote of formal adoption of this hazard mitigation plan. Do I see a motion to adopt by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Uh, Mr. Hurd? Uh, no comments. You know, I, I read through the plan and it was a great presentation a few months back when we went through this additionally, so I'm happy to adopt this. Mr. DeCourcy? Yeah, I feel the same way as Mr. Hurd. And uh, we had a thorough presentation back in January. I think there were a few things added 
based on the comments that night and um, fully uh, willing to support the plan at this point. Thank you, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I'm also happy to support it. It clearly represents a lot of work, and uh, you know this is the type of pre this is the type of preparation that would ge that generally turns, you know, what could be a much worse situation into a hopefully less bad one. And uh, I really appreciate the investment. I think it's very good. Mr. Carroll, thank you. I'll also be supporting it. I I appreciate the inclusion of uh, some of the uh, public feedback that was received and uh, the incorporation of. Uh, some of the recommendations that also uh, came in. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, if you could pass along our thanks to Ms. Wright and the planning department. They've had so many things they've had to do fast, furious, um, and we needed it three days ago, um, whether it's the CDBG CARES Act, uh, whether it's uh, the hazard, hazardous mitigation plan, all the other normal town business that needs to go on in this COVID-19 world. Um, I, I almost expect that we're not going to get this turnaround when we're undergoing these things because of everything else planning's doing with, you know, um, Ali Cotter and uh, lead economic developer working with the businesses. So I just want you to pass on to them. Um, I hope they're taking some time for themselves. I know they're working more than 40 hours a week. Um, I hope they can truly try to get a weekend that they don't do this all the time, but it is a pre it's hard because we're asking them, we need all this stuff done to A, run the town and then B, keep the town safe and running in COVID-19. So, um, but please our sincere thanks on that, Mr. Chapelain. I will absolutely pass it along. You're, and, you're, and you're correct. They're a great team that they're keeping un-COVID related or COVID unrelated uh, balls in the air and focusing their efforts on how we're responding to the pandemic as well. So uh, yeah, my, my kudos to them as well. And I'll pass along the board's thanks. Thank you so much. So if I see any questions or comments, if not on a motion by Mr. Hurd to adopt, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahan? Yes. So unanimous vote, agenda item 11 is closed. We now go to agenda item 12, discussion, the Massachusetts FY21 budget, which is one of those balls up in the air that um, could change at any given minute. And the, our town manager has been very uh, vi vigilant about um, as we get news, important news um, that impacts our town budget, whether it's from the state house, from the federal government, from the long range planning uh, committee or others. So uh, with that, I will ask our town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so with the board's indulgence, I, I'd like to use this agenda item to provide an update on where we stand uh, in the FY20 budget, what we're looking at for the FY21 budget, and how really primarily uh, the state's budget for FY21 impacts how we're thinking about things. So um, for FY20, uh, I know Sandy and Ida covered this a little bit at the board's last meeting, or really covered it entirely. For FY20, we are in, uh, we're, we're still in solid shape. Uh, meals tax and hotel tax have been greatly reduced, but otherwise uh, local receipts uh, and other tax collections have been uh, near on par with past fiscal years. And the big item we'd be worried about is whether or not there would be a mid-year state aid cut based on the tax revenues that the state is losing during this current fiscal year, fiscal year 20. However, the governor has said on numerous occasions, um, it's likely too late in the year for state aid cuts and that the state will uh, limp to the end of FY20 in the governor's words. So we feel uh, we feel good about our ability to finish FY20 uh, in the black despite these very challenging circumstances. FY21 uh, and beyond uh, obviously is much more uncertain and likely to be much more challenging. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, you know, we were still in the, the early early days or months after a successful override last year and looking at our long range plan and how much better our picture uh, was looking after the governor's budget came out. But unfortunately, that has changed uh, with the onset of this pandemic. Right now, uh, state officials are expecting anywhere between a four to $6 billion revenue shortfall next year, or they, they expect to collect four to $6 billion less than what had been projected in the governor's budget, which was released in January. So that is a tremendous percentage of their budget. Uh, if you take out their non-discretionary spending on healthcare, it's almost 25% of their budget. So it's obviously very likely that we will see a significant state aid cut next year. 
there is the possibility of further federal assistance, um, though hard to count on that at this point, which could backfill some of that revenue gap. Uh, but I would still expect one way or the other uh, to be for there to be se severe or significant impacts uh, in terms of state aid and FY21 and beyond. So we are uh, we, we don't know what those numbers will be, and the state, uh, like us, doesn't really know what the exact impacts of this pandemic will be on a, on an ongoing basis. So it's going to be very hard for them to adopt a budget, and they may even choose to adopt one twelfth budgets for the first few months of the fiscal year, starting on July first. So that will be, will be interesting to watch how that plays out over the next several months. Um, however, locally, uh, two weeks ago, we met with our revenue working group and last week met with our long range planning committee to discuss what we thought a range of scenarios might be from a revenue point of view, and then what the corresponding expense changes might need to be in FY21. So last week we met with the long range planning committee and we discussed impacts on our own local receipt collections our own projections of free cash, our own uh, expectations for what state aid would be, uh, and how much overlay surplus we may or may not want to use as an operating revenue on a go forward basis. And we ultimately uh, agreed to meet again this Friday as a long range planning committee. And uh, we, we were, though no decisions were made, we we're honing in on the assumption of, a, of an approximate 15% cut in state aid for FY21. And the committee asked both myself and Sandy on the town side and Superintendent Bodie and Mike Mason on the school side to come up with two expenditure scenarios. One where uh, we look at reducing what our expected increase in FY21 was supposed to be and reduce that by 10%, uh, which is a, a, mod a moderate to light uh, expenditure reduction. And we're also been, we've also been asked to look at it much more serious or much heavier cut, which would be just level funding the FY21 budgets for the town and the school as compared to FY20, uh, which would be a much, much more significant reduction. So we're gonna bring back uh, the frameworks of those two, um, those two approaches to the committee on Friday. And then hopefully within a week or two from Friday, we'll be able to go to the finance committee with recommended alterations to the FY21 budget. So the finance committee can consider those and then produce a final finance committee report, which would ultimately go before a town meeting currently expected to be held on June 15. So I tried to go through that. Uh, there's a lot to parse through there, but I tried to go through that pretty quickly. And I'd be happy to answer any questions the board might have. Okay, first, if I could take a motion to move receipt by Mr. Kiro, seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Um, Mr. Kiro. Um. Thank you for the update. Um, it's obviously of you know great concern. I'll, I'll look forward to hearing the um, outcome of the long range planning uh, discussions. Um, you know, clearly if, if, uh, if the outlook is as dire as it seems to be uh, for, for the state, um, you know, it looks like it is going to impact, you know, one or more of the commitments that we made, um, you know, prior to last year's override. I mean, if the math doesn't add up. So um, I think it's going to be very important um, as long range planning runs through scenarios and you come back to the board to um, with, you know, your intended path that, that, that we are all clear about how, how um, those commitments are, 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 uh, are impacted so that we can assist in the uh, um, the communication around those. Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Mr. Dunn and I attended the, the Long Range Planning Committee uh, meeting last week as, as the board's designees to the committee. And, it, and it's you know, particularly difficult because we don't know what the state government's gonna do, but state government doesn't know what the federal government's going to do. And it makes such a big difference. And, and of course, um, we may not know for several months whether there's gonna be federal funds available to backfill revenue losses, or, or if there is a, a future act that, that will provide state and local relief. And, and so that's what makes it so challenging in terms of what you do in terms of the projections. But I think 
we had a good dis discussion last week and Tom Manager laid it out in terms of what the ranges of um, possibilities are for, for fiscal 21 and, and uh, we'll have a further discussion this Friday. But to Mr. Kira's point, and there's no question is there, there are certain assumptions made in terms of what state aid will be over a period of time, uh, next four or five years. And it, those change dramatically as other assumptions. And I think the important thing for us is to try to get as good of information as we can, um, act on it, come back to the board, to the people and let them know what's going on, but, but really continue to press the need for federal help because that's, that's really critical. And, and because states and local governments have to have balanced budgets, we're reliant on the federal government in times like this to, to backfill, frankly. And so um, we'll just have to keep our eye on that and, and, um, and meet regularly. Okay, thank you. And I must say, I misremembered. I had in my head that Mr. Kiro and Mr. DeCourcy were on long range. Um, Finance Committee. I couldn't remember um, who Mr. DeCourcy stepped in for. I usually try to call on the people who are on the committee first. So apologies to uh, my colleague, Mr. Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with the with the with the previous comments in, uh, entirely. And uh, not, uh, adding to the list of unknowns include things like what is school going to look like in the fall. And are they going to be able, how many uh, kids are going to be in the classroom or are they going to be remote learning? Or are there going to be two shifts? And that is going to have dramatic impact on the, um, or one could imagine it could, ha it could have dramatic impact on the school budgets. And we also don't have a way of looking at that right now. Um, I guess the one thing that I want, that I'm, that I'm particularly concerned about is that uh, when you think about our other multi-year plans, we've always gotten if we got a surprise, it was always a good surprise early on. And it made those multi-year plans effectively relatively easy for us to stick to because we got good news early that we could then carry on. And uh, we are in the unfortunate situation where we're getting bad news early. And I think that that really means that we, we've, you know, this is yet another thing that we can't just do what we've done before. And I do think that that's going to require us to look harder and be more aggressive about uh, cutting. And I, uh, one of the proposals I got in an email from another member of Long Range Planning uh, afterwards was to consider doing the moderate cut for 21, but level fund the budget for 20, FY22, FY23, FY24, which means, of course, if you level fund the budget, it does mean reduction in, uh, you know, in staff. It do probably doesn't mean layoffs. It probably means through att attrition and such, but it does remain er uh, a reduction in services. And I think that that's a very serious proposal that we should think about because uh, we, I think that we, we may need to start thinking what does that look like? Um, there are a lot of things, uh, the, the good news, bad news about that is that if we adopt that level budget look forward, there's still plenty of months for us to be pleasantly surprised and then be able to add money back in. Um, but it also, um, sets the posture where we're kind of where we we're, we're thinking about the hard choices that we need to make uh rather because it, uh, i don't think autopilot or cruise control is going to get us through this i think it's going to require us to um make some hard choices thank you mr don mr hart thank you for the presentation you know, it was the numbers are bleak but not unexpected but it gives me confidence to know that the town is being proactive in anticipation of what could be some tough times to come. And, um, you know, certainly the old, old adage, plan for the worst and hope for the best applies here where it's a wait and see situation. I'm glad to see that we're taking steps to prepare for it. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine, I saw, I've read everything because everything is sent to everybody like you all have too. So I may be mixing apples and sneakers at this point. So please correct me if it's not relevant, but I have in my head that I re re uh, reviewed a release either from State Senator Cindy Friedman and or Representative Sean Garberly outlining sort of end of, uh, end of week summary um, and saying that I believe I could be scrambled eggs uh, under the Federal CARES Act 
Arlington's designation was approximately 4 million. Am I correct on that? So, yes, but can, do, would you like me to explain that? What I was going to say is, could you explain that? Because <laughs> I don't know if it's, yes, could you explain that? So right now, the state has in its coffers $500 million approximately from the CARES Act that is earmarked for distribution to cities and towns. So our initial uh, take from that is just shy of $4 million. But right now, based on the way the CARES Act was written, none of that money can be used to backfill uh, revenue loss and none of it can be used. Um, it can, and it can't be used for already prior budgeted expenses. It can right now only be used for COVID-19 related response. So we are, um, rapidly compiling all of our money spent to date on our COVID-19 response, as well as what we think we might spend in the future. Um, but unless there's a change in the way the CARES Act is written, that money is not going to be able to save us from what we're talking about right now. Now, it is worth mentioning there are multiple horses riding in Washington right now. There is a, an ongoing effort to change the regulations of the existing CARES Act, so those monies can be used in a different way. And there are further stimulus bills being discussed uh, that could funnel money uh, either to states or directly to cities and towns. But uh, yes, it's accurate that there is a large amount of CARES Act money that could be available to the town. The challenge is um, what exactly we can do with that money per the CARES Act regulation is an ongoing dialogue. And am I correct that, um just I'm trying to get at the information that the funding initial funding we received under CDBG CARES Act 2 of approximately 670,000 and we anticipate but things could always change at the last minute a possible uh, second funding um, to that facet of CDBG um, is that included in the four million or is that separate from that totally separate uh, pots but like um, what you just stated on the a possible 4 million, we still have um, the same uh, stringent or not stringent um, in terms of the CDBG CARES 2 Act funding we just received and may received a second um, allocation. There are also really uh, strict guidelines around that or do we have a little more flexibility? I think I know the answer, but I wanna ask. The general CARES Act money is, is not restricted by income eligibility or census block or census tract limitations like the HUD money is, like the CDBG money, but it is restricted for what it can be expended on. Okay, and I guess I would leave it to uh, the town manager and anyone else on finance committee, long range planning, town council, in terms of um, if there's any way, um, the way the language is written about the 4 million that where we now have um, what the governor has issued today in terms of um, opening up the economy and um, the board, boards of health already have um, enforcement um, powers, um, but have been uh, extolled or um, added to that in terms of part of the enforcement of um, opening up Massachusetts safely and slowly. I was just saying, I guess I'll leave it to you all in terms of um, saying it couldn't go to a personnel, couldn't go to a salary per, per se, um, but I don't know if the case, if it's worth it, could be made to say we now have employees um, that we budgeted under um, salary for job duties and responsibilities that now are doing additional, doing all that. And on top of that, and I don't know if there was some way, you know, if it was allowed through the law that even partial um, monies from that $4 million could go to salaries. My point being, if we can find a way that we, we can be allocated and spend that $4 million, don't go through that exercise, but I would hate like everybody else too, when we're making the hard decisions um, to not do everything we can, you know, legally, which is what we should do for that. And then my second question is, again, scrambled eggs. Um, I've been um, listening and, and um, reading some uh, statements and, and YouTubes from Senate President Karen Spilka, and she keeps referencing, and I have not done my research or my homework, that um, the, the, she anticipates the Senate to come out by July 1st with uh, a possible proposal. And my read on it is it's still going to be um, 
we are we have the option of doing a budget, a one in 12 budget, doing it monthly, but that maybe the Senate has some other way that, that they're gonna propose. So my thing is, do you know what might be coming out of that? And is that something we would even avail ourselves of? Because I don't wanna you know, spend extra time on something I shouldn't. I think what you might be referring to is a bill the Senate has passed and is now before the House that would allow for a remote town meeting. No, uh, okay. No, I'll send you one. Yeah, no, there was some. Yeah. No, she kept she kept referencing the one slash 12 um, and then monthly budget. So you know what? Maybe I'm misreading it now forward to you. The, the all legislation that's already passed would allow the town to do a one twelfth budget. Um, and I, but I know the Senate and the House have been talking about doing one twelfth budgets for the state. Uh, which would mean our clarity on a number wouldn't come until the fall, likely. Okay. Um, but we we currently, if we if we thought the most prudent course was to, to do one twelve budgets, we could we currently could do that under existing law. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, with that, on a motion to move receipt by Mr. Carroll, mm -hmm. seconded by Mr. DeCourcy. Any further questions and comments? If not. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. There, there is a hand raised, Madam Chair. Oh. I don't know if you want to uh, take any comments or questions from the. Normally we don't, but since it is a budget item and we're in COVID-19, if you could just give me the person's name, I will take this person. Uh, it's Elizabeth Dre. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dre, if you could just say your name and address for the record. When you're unmuted, we can see your name, but I can see that your microphone I think you might be on now. I think, I don't know if Ms. Dre can hear us. I'm hearing a little bit of clicking, so I want to give it a little bit more time. And her name is gone. So um, uh, Attorney Heim, roll call. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Curo? Yes. Mr. Dunn? Yes. Ms. Mahon? Yes. That is a unanimous vote. Agenda item 12 is now closed. We now go to agenda item 13, policy review co code of conduct. Um, I'm going to have very little to say on this. I'll let Mr. Curo explain it. Um, uh, I did ask that if he would afford me the opportunity as nearing the end of my 14 month, 12 month chairmanship that um, I wanted to uh, pass the gavel, which has been sanitized and I haven't touched it since March 12th. I've been back in the chambers. Um, just to formally ask him, in one of my last duties as chair to uh, uh, basically oversee this uh, board item, but with a uh, time frame that I'll let him explain it, uh, Mr. Kiro. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot more to say um, on this. At the last meeting, I had um, actually referenced um, a couple of forums that I attended during the uh, Massachusetts Municipal Association's uh, annual meeting in uh, January. I attended two panel discussions. Um, one was on uh, social media policies. Um, and actually, one of the presenters was... Um, uh, Liz Valerio, who's uh, been a long time uh, labor counsel for for um, us. Um, <clears throat> and I also attended one on, uh, it was uh, public speaking and civility. So it was around really the conduct of um, uh, public meetings. Um, and I'd say both of these panels, they, they kind of talked about the covenant and the two-way street and, and um, policies that public bodies can take to kind of set expectations around their own behavior as well as um, uh, the expectations for, for the conduct of um, you know, civil discourse um, th uh, through their meetings. Um, so we've had a lot of questions that have come up over time. I, the material that's on Novus is really just all of the handouts that, I, that were uh, provided to um, panel participants. Um, there's the presentation of, from the uh, social media panel um, there is the presentation from the um, public speaking um, civility panel, um, a couple of uh, model policies from some other Massachusetts communities, um, as well as a, um, 
uh, a tip sheet um, that was actually put together by a, uh, a school board um, uh, association. It has a lot of good uh, information um, in it. Um, the, the nature of the MMA meetings, as you all know, is, is the audience is mixed. So, you know, some of the audience um, will be, you know, select board members and elected officials and others will be um, municipal administrators and managers. So um, I'd say that nothing that's in here is really um, like something you could lift and shift to, to uh, Arlington because of our um, particular form of, of municipal government. But what I wanted to suggest or offer um, is to take some of these materials and these ideas and take a look at the, the select board policy handbook. Um, once we get past town meeting, <laughs> which uh, I know that uh, uh, town council is, is, is deep in town meeting, um, if the board is so inclined, I'd like to offer to, to work with town council on a model policy that would be appropriate for us and for inclusion in the handbook that addresses uh, some some of these issues, um, and then uh, br bring it back uh, at some point. Um, you know, we will have you know one or two new members at, at that time as well for for uh, consideration um, by the board. And th that's really all I wanted to uh, um, uh, present. And make sure that you had all the material. Thank you so much. And we don't need a vote on this. It's more just laying the, the groundwork um, and passing it over to the next incoming chair um, after we get through um, our unique town meeting, um, you know, into the fall, beginning of winter, I'll leave that to the incoming chair and Mr. Carroll's discretion on that. So now we go to, you're gonna decide whether Dan and I move on or stay on in our current roles. Uh, uh, Agenda item 14, discussion, June 2020, select board meetings. As you know, we have the June 8th meeting, which is an organizational meeting, but it also can be um, a business meeting. Um, but with June, I believe June 22nd is the anticipated or stated date of our um, regular town meeting focused purely on the town budgets and doing the business of the town. So we really can't count the 22nd as a select board meeting. And again, with continuing on with doing the town's business, um, what say you all, um, do you want to add June 1st or June 15th? I'm not sure. It's funny to say everyone check their schedules, but you really do have to, because I don't know like anybody else, I'm working, doing so much you know what work here at home i've never worked so much i did less work when i went out to do my job but um uh what say you uh who wants mr dunn or mr de the first versus the eighth i was thinking the eight, well i mean not the first the first versus the 15th or some other night anyone madam chair uh I will obviously be delighted to attend any meeting that's called before June 6th, but at the same time, I wonder whether, uh, to me, I would be asking, the, uh, my question is, uh, do you need a meeting after the election, but before town meeting? Okay, so that's one, six, one, five. Um, I think we do, um, for the select board's office to uh, get the, how about if we do this, can we all look at our schedules and see if we're available June 1st, um, if we do need that second meeting, and then I will check with the select board's office and Mrs. Kropelka to A, do we need that meeting? If we don't, I'll let them communicate that. And if she says, yes, we do, but it would be better on the 15th, um, I will instruct them to have that as an agenda item on June 8th. Is that too confused? Is that all okay, uh, Mr. Chapterling? We, we may want to come back on June first with the results of the uh, shared streets pilot. So I, I I don't mean to bring the board in unnecessarily, but if we if we have results that are positive and we want to move forward, I, I think we'd like that opportunity if the board's willing. So Arlington's 2020 Groundhog Day Select Board COVID 19 <laughs> life. I'm sorry. No, I, I feel like we, like, is it Monday? I'm meeting, right? <laughs> but anyways, is that, I'm, I don't mean to be um, disrespectful and jovial about that. I've never seen the movie Ground Day, Groundhog Day, but I kind of understood the concept, but 
living it is a whole nother thing. Mr. DeCourcy, is that June 1st uh, amenable, okay with you? Yeah, that, that's fine. I'm glad Mr. Chapterlain spoke up. I think the uh, Mr. Kerr and Mr. Hurd and I were, <laughs> were reluctant to throw out a date. And, and uh, um, I, I think for that reason that he cited and also that there, it will be two weeks passing and there may be a need to appoint more election workers that evening. So mm. reluctantly, I'm looking more at Mr. Dunn here because uh, that will require another meeting of him, but uh, I, I, it probably does make sense. I'm just going to put a meeting every day that week. <laughs> but anyways, Mr. Hard. Yeah. Yes. It um, works for me. It's a very little inconvenience to walk down to the basement. So <laughs> I guess I'll see you there. Oh, Mr. Kiro. Yeah, it works for me. I mean, my, my only concern with it would be if... Um, if it was an issue for the staff where they're getting ready for the election. Um, now I, I know we usually avoid um, Mondays when there's a Tuesday election. So I don't know if that's, that's an issue. I'd, I'd want, want that checked, but um, I, I can see um, the wisdom in having that. And, and just, just for clarification, I mean, we're, we're definitely looking to schedule June Eighth, correct. That's already that has to happen. By yeah, yeah, so yeah. That's a reorganizational okay. meeting. And correct. Then a correct. That's why I ask it. Yep. Okay. Uh, okay. And though, my friend, it seems your fate is sealed, I still will turn to you, Mr. Dunn, and ask for you I to will opine. I'm delighted to join you all on June first. Okay, um, Attorney Heim, do we need a vote on that, or? I think it's probably wise that we take one just in case. Okay, so we'll move uh, approval by Mr. Dunn, who's smiling at the fact of doing that, seconded by Mr. Curo, who also is agreeing with that wholeheartedly, um, to schedule a regularly scheduled meeting for Monday, June 1st, 7 to 15 p.m., June 1st, 2020. Roll call, please, Attorney Heim. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahon. Yes. Okay. And so we will hear from uh, we all, Mrs. Kropelka, but the select board's office did say, you know, it looks like they might need another night to meet. So um, we're prepared and we can, the big thing, pivot if we have to. I like to say adapt. He likes to say pivot, whatever. We now go to final votes and comments, articles for review, uh, Article 50, endorsement of CDBG application, Article 51, revolving funds, Article 52, endorsement of parking benefit district expenditures. Is there a motion to approve final votes and comments on Articles 50, 51, and 52? So moved. Moved Second. by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Hurd. I know we've all had the opportunity to read it. Are there any amendments, deletions, or uh, if not, on a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, seconded by Mr. Hurd to move approval, final votes and comments of Article 50, 51, and 52. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mahon. Yes, and that is a unanimous vote for final votes and comments. We now go to correspondence received. We have two um, from Patricia Barron Warden, um, as well as one from uh, Beth Malofchek. First, is there a motion to move receipt by? Move receipt. Mr. Hurd, seconded by? Second. Mr. Kiro, any comments or questions on either of these pieces of correspondence? If not on a motion, move receipt by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Kiro. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Kiro. Yes. Yes. Ms. Mahon. Yes. A unanimous vote on correspondence received, 5 0. We now go to new business. Uh, town Council, Attorney Heim. Uh, just one small piece of new business in addition to all the other things going on right now. We received two uh, timely applications for host community agreements for our retail marijuana dispensaries. Uh, one from Calix Peak, I believe applied in the previous round, and one from a new applicant called the Human Connection. Just for the public's information, um, the process is that there is a preliminary review team made up of different department heads that will take a look at these applications, do things like background checks, examine the claims made and then make sure they're in the proper zoning areas. Um, then we'll uh, have to convene 
the marijuana study group to take a look at these applications um, and provide any substantive questions or comments to the board before the board uh, convenes a hearing to decide which applicants, um, if any, it wants to grant um, a the last sort of remaining license to. It's a little bit complicated because the HCA shouldn't be confused with the special permit, but realistically speaking, it's unlikely that we would want to have a situation where we have more than three HCAs at any given time. The board is not obligated to issue any HCAs. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you, Attorney Heim. Our town manager, Mr. Chapdelaine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, three pieces I'd like to briefly touch on. Uh, one, a brief election update for the board. Uh, so I think as the board is aware, the postcard uh, that serves as the early, uh, early mail-in voting uh, request form or application went out last week. And I heard today that people have started receiving the postcard. Uh, so if folks can get that back into the clerk's office. They'll turn it around as quickly as possible to get those ballots back to anybody who sends that signed card in. Uh, we've also purchased and acquired three drop boxes and picked sites for them. There will be one in East Arlington at the corner of Mass Ave in Lake on the Winter Street side near Town Tavern. There will be one in front of Town Hall on the lower plaza, so down below the stairs on the brick part of the plaza. And there will be one in the Heights at the corner of Mass Ave and Park Ave in front of or nearby the, um, the clock or what used to be Brigham's, Diggum's, or now the optometrists uh, location. So uh, those three will be there. They will be very plainly and easily marked saying ballots only, do not insert mail. Uh, so either absentee ballots or early voting ballots can be put in so that people won't have to pay postage to drop those off. Uh, we're currently still meeting uh, mostly every other day, uh, a sort of a cross-functional team of myself, town council, health and human services, facilities, select board's office, clerk's office, uh, as well as pu the public uh, information officer to make sure that we're doing all we can to both um, provide outreach and notification about this election as well as plan safely for the election. Uh, I wanna give a special thanks to Jim Feeney, the interim facilities director and Jim O'Connor, uh, the assistant town moderator, town meeting member, uh, as well as a warden who's really been providing us his invaluable expertise in the way polling places actually worked. And he's been going with Jim Feeney uh, location by location and providing uh, detailed schematics of how we're going to safely get people to come in one way, access their ballot, insert it into the voting machine, and then leave another way so that we can safely have people um, enter and exit without any cross current. Uh, so there'll be more updates to come, but I wanted to provide that update to the board tonight in regards to the election. I uh, also wanted to mention uh, the work of the Economic Recovery Task Force that the board created at its last uh, last meeting. Uh, it's now already met three times. Uh, I had provided the board a memo via email of their uh, work to date. They met again today and starting at the board's next meeting, they'd like to start making a regular update to the board on the work that they've done, progress they've made, and potentially changes or relief they might want to seek either through the board or other means. Uh, so that work has been, has been ongoing. Uh, I think it's also very timely and obviously important given the governor's announcements today about the start of a reopening. I think today was a soft start with manufacturing and construction, but more to come next week and then obviously future phases to come. So we're going to continue to focus on uh, from both an economic and planning point of view, but also a public health point of view, how we best um, start to reopen Arlington over the course of the next few months. And then finally, I'd like to mention uh, that I heard from several board members today, uh, as well as several residents uh, and others about a very disturbing incident that occurred in the Mugar Woods on Saturday evening. Uh, there was a, a fire involving propane tanks uh, that was very rightfully disturbing to uh, many of the residents in that area. So I plan to uh, obviously communicate with board members, but work closely with the chief of police, the director of health and human services and town council uh, to develop what the, what the right next step is. Um, this is not an issue that's been ignored. It's actually an issue that health and human services, the police department working with the Somerville Homeless Coalition has paid a real tremendous amount of attention to over the past few years. Uh, this board created a homelessness task force, which has been populated in meeting. Uh, so a lot of focus, attention, and efforts have been put into working with this population. But the incident that occurred Saturday night has obviously increased um, people's desire to, for us to, to focus more and see what we can do to create a safe environment. So uh, those discussions will be happening in the next few days, and I hope to be able to report more publicly soon. And that's all I have. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine. Mr. DeCourcy. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Chapdelaine, for for the comments on the the incident that, that the Mugar cited. It, it was very troubling, and and we had a discussion earlier today, and and the, the town has been doing a lot there, but it, it's a very challenging situation. I know that that you've already reached out, as you said, to um to to different uh, agencies within the town, and and. Uh, you know, probably outside the town as well regionally. So I look forward to, to working with you on that. Um, one piece of new business since, since our last meeting, um, I attended a, a salute that took place. Uh, it happened at Mount Auburn Hospital. Mount Auburn Hospital is one of the two hospitals that Arlington uh, Rescue uh, brings patients to. And in fact, the, the primary location. And um, there was a salute that day of first responders to healthcare workers and the Arlington Police and Fire Department, Belmont, Cambridge, and Watertown all saluted the healthcare workers. And here's a picture from that day of the, uh, the police department in the um, engine two. And it, this was a very powerful, um, very powerful presentation because you can see there the, the healthcare workers came out just before the, um, the police and fire came down to salute them. And, and that very morning, the, uh, the Boston Symphony had released a virtual uh, presentation of Summon the Heroes, which they dedicated to first responders and healthcare workers. And the heroes were here in, in, in your picture. And uh, just, uh, we've seen this across the country, but I, I watched it and uh, it found it to be very moving. And, and again, uh, throughout this whole pandemic, I wanna thank our first responders and our healthcare workers and so many others who are working so hard. Thank you, Mr. DeCarsi. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting that tickle again. Mr. Hurd. Yep, just two things. Um, so as I alluded to earlier, the Economic Development, uh, Economic Recovery Task Force has met twice now, uh, two weeks straight. I just wanna thank the Economic Development Coordinator, Ali Carter and Planning Director, Jenny Rate for their work with the, uh, with the task force. It's really, it's, we're very early in the process, but we can already tell that bringing the businesses together to brainstorm on ideas on how to move forward as we get more information from the state as to when the business can do so will be very beneficial. Um, so I look forward to continuing with the task force. Um, and then just want to remind everyone that Memorial Day is coming up and there is still going to be an event. It will be closed to the public, but you can look for it on ACMI. It starts at, at 9.30 a.m. Um, Jeff Chunglo has been doing a lot of work to continue to honor fallen soldiers on Memorial Day, even in the midst of this pandemic. So be sure to look for that on ACMI. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Kiro. Uh, thank you very much. I, I just wanted to note that um, in addition to the um, postcards. I, I received my early voting ballot. My wife and I did today. So folks should be looking for those in the mail as well, because they, they have gone out. Um, I, I would have had more new business, but we have uh, chosen to keep the gavel in your hand and Mr. Dunn in his seat for one more meeting. So uh, I will defer until June 1st. <laughs> Thank you. One more time, Mr. Dunn. Uh, I was ready to give a report on long range planning, but I think we covered it sufficiently. And uh, I think that uh, Mr. DeCourcy covered the thank yous better than I can. So I think that's enough for me. That's enough for you. Um, um, Mr. Chapdelaine spoke to Mugar um, and I will for, I'm going to forward to Mr. Chapdelaine and Mr. DeCourcy, um, the correspondence I received from Mark McCabe. And um, with that forwarding, I'll not give it another thought and let the two of you follow through on that, if that's okay. Um, I did want to bring up a, something that I believe is already um, starting to be addressed because of the seriousness of the um, <clears throat> incident. Um, we received uh, correspondence myself and I believe Mr. Chapdelaine um, from a resident on Appleton Street and that correspondence has been time and date stamped by the select board's office for a resident who um, witnessed that unfortunate tragic accident. Um, and I'm not speaking to any causation or, or anything like that. I don't know any particulars, but um, my you know heart goes out to everybody on that as well as um, someone who witnessed it and she has some um, 
statements about what she witnessed that day that was very sad. So um, when I had it stamped correspondence received in the office, I mentioned it to the town manager and I believe it's something that um, he has already been addressing. So I don't think it will need to be an agenda item, but I wanna check with Mr. Chapdelaine on that um, letter from the email from the resident regarding the accident on Appleton Street and possible referral, uh, Mr. Chapdelaine. Due to the nature of the issue, the police department has already asked TAC to renew a review of that intersection. So if, if the board was so inclined, uh, we've already discussed with the town council to take a vote to endorse that TAC review. I think that would be in line. Okay. Um, since this is an emergency situation, um, uh, unless Attorney Heim tells me otherwise, if uh, Attorney Heim? I'm sorry, Mr. Chapdelaine, um, just to be, just to be clear, it's, it's your position that the board's vote is, is necessary for referral in this case? I, I, no, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, okay. I think practice has been, the board sends things to TAC, but I don't, I don't believe that it's actually mm -hmm. codified anywhere. I think, I think what I'd prefer is, 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 it, you can also use, you, the town manager, can also use TAC as a resource and it wasn't on, um, it'll be on our next agenda's correspondence receipt, but I don't want to slow down the process. So with my colleagues agreement on that, um, prefer to leave it that way. And if we need to take a procedural vote, we'll do that at the next meeting. Um, is that okay? I'm going to take that as a yes. Thank you so much. And then um, I want to... Um, Thank Mr. Hurd for his service on what is going to be an extremely busy um, economic development committee. Um, I have been um, putting a lot on Allie Carter and Je Jenny Rates of the planning department's plate. Um, and one of the things that um, I discussed with her this weekend, which will mean more work for you all. Um, I went into one of the cleaners, which different one than mine and spoke to the woman who was behind there making her own face mask, ace cleaners. They were $5, kids and adults. And um, I could see that she, you know, was really stressed. And I started talking to her about the quality of the mask and, you know, how did she get her, her price point of five and five? And I could see that um, she wasn't, she was familiar with that um, term, but a different way. And then um, I started to fill out information to, you know, direct her to Ali Carter, Carter and her email. And she said she didn't know anything about email. She's never used it. And then I asked her about, you know, these days, a small business, you really have to get your word out safely. And that's usually through social media. She didn't know about Facebook. And she's a very intelligent woman. You know, she can speak English and um, her native Asian um, language. And it became apparent. So um, I just wrote some information on a card. She does have a daughter. I asked her to call Allie. And so what I posed to Allie that I'd like the committee to address is a lot of these small businesses, um, not just cleaners, restaurants, and others. Um, not only are uh, they not familiar or, or use um, social media or websites, they don't even have the laptops or um, the capability, whether financially or not. So when I was talking to Allie about that, she said she'd discuss it with the committee, sort of go through and target those businesses, well, identify those businesses and have, um, whether it's a mailing or whether it's um, people from the town going out safely to deliver that information with a possible translation at top. And, and so the reason I say that is um, I would like this committee when they go through um, economic development, especially for small business, um, whether it's through the town planning, whether it's through the Chamber of Commerce or something else that a lot of these small businesses just need to know. Um, if governor says pivot, I say adapt. You know, I said to her, you know, you're a cleaner, you're doing face masks, you should put that down also. And, you know, think of it like earlier, we were talking about possibly a pilot program for uh, businesses on the cor corridor. Um, restaurants and the like, you know, so make sure those people um, know that they need to rethink how to stay afloat and survive um, and that there is a resource. So I'm sorry I'm long in the tooth on that, but I'm just like, like all of us, I just feel for these small businesses. And then um, my last, well, I thought this was my last meeting. <laughs> you thought just when you, but also um, I, 
I have never done this. And I think uh, Mr. Don and Mr. Kiro are really rubbing off on me. Uh, but I wrote something this morning about 30, 45 minutes before the governor came out with his um, reopening plan and just reading comments over the weekend and leading up to it and really seeing um, two opposing sides um, in terms of you know what would be announced and what wouldn't be announced, as well as so far the five years Arlington and we all have gone through since March 12th. Um, I just wanted to put something out and I just thought it was appropriate. And uh, before I adjourn, take a motion to adjourn, my hair's gone. I just wanted to read it. Um, and I put, as we embark on phase one and not wanting to get into a debate of government control versus public health precautions, I hope when the governor puts forth his advisory board recommendations for reopening Massachusetts, that everyone will act on the side of caution and remember that we're far from coming out on the other side of this. I know the current situation stinks and people are getting a bit antsy to return to the normal life, but that's about a year or two away and we probably will never completely return to normal life. Please remember the reasons we have been and will continue to need to wear face masks and coverings and practice social distancing. I have to say since March 12th, I have seen so many acts of kindness here in Arlington, kindness toward our families, friends, neighbors, and businesses, as well as the partnership between the town and our community. I've been humbled by your actions, Arlington, by coming together to support local businesses, by looking out for your neighbors and making sure they're safe and have what they need, by watching friends help each other, whether it's around food security or even starting the most recent social trend, wine social media groups by making sure our high school seniors get the acknowledgement they deserve at reaching graf, uh, graduation. Um, and due to their sacrifices, missing out on important milestones like prom, traditional graduation ceremony, last day of school, signing each other's yearbooks, staying overnight at Arlington High School last blast party, just to name a, two, a few, in order to obtain our collective goal of flattening the curve of COVID-19 and saving lives. Along with this, I am so thankful for the many acts of appreciation towards all those working on the front line and our first responders, whether they be healthcare, public safety, developmental residential workers, all essential store workers that remain open for us and the list goes on. We need to continue to keep them in our prayers and thoughts and wish them good health and strength as they work every day and night to help us get through this. I suspect someone will, some will be undoubtedly disappointed today with the governor's decisions later this morning, but I do feel he and the advisory board have stuck to relying on the data from the medical experts in the field, and we need to adapt, survive, and thrive moving forward. I'd love to return to the days before we had this COVID-19 world that took over, but we have to face our new reality and move forward from there. Some have asked me if being an elect official in these times is sort of a no-win situation, but I don't feel that way at all. I've been working really hard to get it right and will continue to do that while trying to serve as a positive force here in Arlington, the community I love so much. So I'll stop there. I apology. I apologize for the length of this missive, but remember, I'm also a cheerleading coach. And as Bob Sprague wrote, I am honored to be known as a cheerleader for Arlington. And with that, before announcing our next uh, select board meeting will be June 1st, I will take a motion to adjourn by. So moved. Mr. Hurd, seconded by. Second. Mr. Dunn, um, um, non debatable, on a motion to adjourn by Mr. Hurd, seconded by Mr. Dunn. Attorney Heim, roll call, please. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Curo. Yes. Mr. Dunn. Yes. Ms. Mon. Yes. Thank you. Good night. God bless America. Arlington, America. Where am I? I'm, I'm losing it. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>